Hello, Algebra 2. We're on our last night of notes, and we are talking all about word problems. So go ahead and label the heading of your notes as 7.4, real life applications, and we're also going to be talking about variation, which is all real life as well. All application type questions. So our first real life application is looking at a scenario where two separate um, rates are occurring and seeing if we can make a combined rate faster. So for example, this one says one pump can fill a tank with oil in four hours. A second pump can fill the same tank in three hours. So we're still talking about one tank getting filled, but it takes different times depending on, I guess, how you're filling it. But if both pumps are working at the same time to fill that one tank, what are we thinking how long it take how long it would take in order to fill that tank if both pumps are helping so the idea in this type of question is that you have more help so just like if you're painting a room you might spend four hours painting a room whereas maybe your friend takes two hours to paint a room if you guys painted the room together hopefully it would take you less time and you'd be able to finish faster this is the idea in this question as well so we have one pump and with the first pump, it takes four hours. With the second pump, it takes three hours. But now what we want to know is how long will it take if we use both pumps? So that's our question mark. How long will it take? The way that we set these up is distance over time or rate, okay? So if you think about this, distance is meaning, what are we trying to fill? What are we trying to really accomplish? So in this problem, we're talking about one pump. So I can say one pump takes four hours. So distance over time, so this is the four hours, okay? And this is the pump. If I add both pumps, so I add the second pump, again, one pump, this one takes three hours, then how long will it take for us to do that same pump, so still one pump, but now both of them are working, so how long will that take? There's my x. So what I'm really looking at is if I combine these fractions, how long will it take? So right now we're saying one pump in four hours plus one pump in three hours. Now how can I fill that one pump in x amount of hours? How long will it take? So let's go ahead and combine. We know how to find common denominator now. So if I have 1 fourth plus 1 third equals 1 over x, oops, excuse me, 1 third, there we go. My common denominator is going to be, I'm going to need the 4 and the 3. So I'm going to need to multiply by 3 over 3. And then on this side, I'm going to need to multiply by 4 over 4. Okay? So I'm going to need to put those together and I will have 3 over 12 plus 4 over 12 equals 1 over x. Now that I have a common denominator, I can add those two fractions together, making 7 over 12 is equal to 1 over x. So the whole point of us learning how to solve equations last time on day 3 was because now when I'm doing my real life application, I can cross multiply to find out what my answer is going to be. So if I cross multiply, I'll get 7x is equal to 12, which means that x is equal to 12 over 7. So if I think about 12 over 7, that's about 1, close to 1, and close to 2 almost, right? So basically if both pumps are working, I take closer to 2 hours, which is a lot less time, than if I just had one pump going separately, okay? So 12 over 7, again, close to 2, 1 point something, right, close to 2, and uh, that takes a lot less time, that's hours, if both pumps are working instead of just one at a time. So this is the first example of a real life problem, and we will do several more of these when I see you guys next time. The rest of our notes today are going to be working with variation. And the first variation is known as direct variation. So I'm going to write direct at the top. 
And if you guys will read this word problem, this is actually really similar to what a lot of you guys are doing when you go to work, right? A lot of you guys have jobs. So if you work six hours and you get paid an hourly rate, does your salary correlate with how many hours that you work? So in other words, if you work more hours, does your salary also go up? Or if you work fewer hours, does your salary go down, right? So write an equation to represent this. Well, if I say that my total salary that I earn is, let's say I work six hours, all right? So that six hours is multiplied by an hourly rate. So I might multiply that by R. Let's say R is my rate, okay? So what happens is as one increases, your total increases as well, okay? So if my R gets bigger, my total will get bigger. So what this is gonna look like is it's the same thing as if I said Y is equal to six X. So if X is like my rate, my R, and y is like my total, I basically just have a linear equation, okay? If you are going to graph this, well, y equals six x, that means it goes through the origin, and my slope is six, so six over one, that means I go up six and over one, so I have a really steep line that kind of looks like that. What you'll notice about a direct variation is that every time that you graph it, it goes through the origin, so it crosses the origin, just like this one does, it goes directly through the origin right there, okay, and it's linear. So every time that you graph a direct variation, it's going to go through the origin and it's linear. So that is a direct variation. The second type of variation is called an inverse variation. And you guys already know inverse variation because we've talked about how um, an inverse is where we switch our x and y, right? Or where we basically um, reciprocate numerator and denominator. So this is going to look very similar. We are going to have a fraction for an inverse variation. This problem tells us that the pitch, so when you listen to pitch, so sound waves, right? When we listen to pitch, the pitch is equal, so pitch is equal, that's my equal sign there, to 1056 divided by the wavelength. So we're gonna say that P is equal to pitch, and we're gonna say W is wavelength, and the equation I would get would look just like this, right? P is equal to 1056 divided by the wavelength. Is pitch directly or inversely related to the wavelength? Remember, directly looks like a line. So I'm not sure this one is actually going to look like a line. In order to check this, I want to switch my P and my W to my Y and my X. So I'm going to take Y equals 1056 divided by x. And I'm going to pause here to grab my calculator. So if you guys have your calculator with you at home, go ahead and pause here and graph this on your calculator. And then let's compare what our graphs look like. All right, guys, so in our graphing calculator, we're going to put in the, 10, 000, the 1056 divided by x, and we're going to graph it. And the question was, does it look linear Ah, so I can't see it, so I'm going to have to zoom out. Let's go to zoom out. The question was, does it look linear? Oh my goodness. Well, I see part of it right now. It definitely does not look linear. I'm going to zoom out one more time just to make sure that I know exactly what it looks like. Okay. Yeah, definitely not linear. So what's happening here is that it's inversely related. And we talked about an inverse as being a reflection over the diagonal line y equals x. So if I take my diagonal line and I kind of just draw it over that diagonal there, y equals x, it really does look like it is an inverse. If I fold it, they would match up. So that's my inverse graph. So every time that you have an inverse relation, it's going to look like this instead of like a line, which is the direct relation, all right? So let's go ahead back to your notes and draw that down. Uh, 
Alrighty. So back in our notes, we will go ahead and sketch what it looked like. And it was way, 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 way out. And the reason why is because it was at 1056. So it was way far away from our origin. Um, so we really would only see a little piece of it if we graphed it on our paper. So we've now talked about direct variation and inverse variation. The last one we're going to talk about is called joint variation. It basically puts together two different types of variation, okay? So we have joint variation as our last one. And kind of a neat scenario to think about for joint variation is if you, if you don't know about Siberian tigers, they eat a lot and they are huge animals. So Siberian tigers will eat 20 pounds of meat per day. So already I'm going to put down 20 times D, so times the days, all right? So I'll say D is my days. Uh, if S Siberian tigers, so S is the number of Siberian tigers, okay, uh, wind up eating for D amount of days, okay, I already have D for days, what is the total amount of meat the Siberians are going to eat? So T for total. So I already have, oops, I already have 20 times the amount of days, but now I also want to multiply by how many tigers I have, so I'm going to multiply by S as well, and then that's going to give me my total amount of meat. So if you guys notice, in all the other problems, I've had a number, but then I've had one variable with that number, and then I've had the variable on the other side of the equation. Now I have this extra variable, so with the word joint, that means I'm bringing together another variable. So I'm actually multiplying by two variables here. So if I wanted to replace this with x's and y's, I would still replace the y for the t, 20 is my constant number, That's re that doesn't change. 20 is the amount that they eat per day, amount of pounds. Um, D would be my X, and now I need another variable. So the other variable that we use is a Z, all right? And that makes a joint variation. We do not have a picture of this because it has three variables, and we only graph in two variables, all right? In all of the examples that we did, though, there was a constant number. So for example, in this joint one, the 20 stays constant. It doesn't change throughout the whole problem. In the inverse variation problem, 1056 was our constant number. That's not changing. X and Y will change, but the 1056 doesn't. In our work problem, the direct variation problem, the 6, 6 stayed the same and the other numbers changed. So we call that number our constant of variation. All right, so if y varies directly with x, what you guys will notice, case one, this is our direct variation, y varies directly with x, we have a k, and that k represents the constant. You can also say y varies directly with x, and that will always give you guys the straight line. For inversely, we're always going to have y is equal to k divided by x, just like the wavelength um, and pitch question. K, again, is our constant of variation. I'll write that here. These are our constants of variation. And remember, the inverse problem didn't look like a line. It looked like those curves. And we'll talk about what those curves look like next unit. We're going to graph those ourselves. But for right now, we just have to identify that they're inverses. And then last but not least, the joint one. Joint variation would be y is equal to, we have the x and the z, and then that number, the 20 pounds for our Siberian tigers, that's going to be our constant. So in every problem, there's this constant number that doesn't change throughout the whole problem. Okay? The three examples here at the bottom, go ahead and pause and see if you guys can set these up without looking at my work ahead of time. Um, you're welcome to look at it to guide you, but really it doesn't matter what the variables are. You guys are looking for the keys and the words in the sentence. So anytime that it says y varies, or look here in the second example, it says y varies again, but then in the third example it says z varies. Anytime you see the varies part, write it down in the order that you're reading. So if y varies, we write y equals. If z varies, then we write z equals. We always have the k, and then you want to fill in the other letters with what the problem's telling you.